This is The Second Studio, hosted by the Architecture and Design Office fame. My name is David Lee, and with me is Marina Bordeaux-Rene. This week, our guest is Holly Snow Hollenbeck. Holly is the founder and principal designer of HSH Interiors, a design office in San Francisco and Truckee. Yes, and with Holly, we talk about, of course, where she's from, where she studied, what did she study, and the many different things that she did before uh, focusing um, on design and then starting her own office. So we discussed that whole track. We talked about um, growing the office from just herself to now they're around 12 people, the work that they do, their their philosophy, their process with clients, and also a lot of conversation about what it means to collaborate with other professionals. So how do architects and designers and interior designers all get along and work together efficiently? Right? Or, and not efficiently. or not efficiently. And egos. <laughs> and we talk about <laughs> egos for sure. Uh, it was a great conversation. We covered a bunch of stuff. It went by super fast. I know you guys are going to enjoy it. So here we go, right? Sponsors. We are supported by Enscape. Enscape is a real-time visualization and VR tool that we personally use and recommend. Now, why do we like it? Well, it's fast and realistic, but it's also really easy to use. The interface is great, it has a strong library of components, and it renders in real time, which means we don't have to waste time waiting for the image to be rendered to see what it will look like. It's also a plugin that works with all of the major 3D modelers, and it's available for Mac and PC. So if you want to up your visualization and rendering game, then definitely check out Enscape by clicking the Enscape 3D link in our show notes. Stop juggling multiple pieces of software and struggling with design-unfriendly spreadsheets. Programma, built by designers for designers, provides an integrated suite of tools for every phase of your project, from mood boards to advanced specification tools, procurement tracking to project management. Seamlessly integrated, easily shareable, and always current, Programma reduces redundancy and minimizes costly error. Join interior design movers and shakers by starting for free at programma.design slash secondstudio. Experience the difference with Programma, software built for interior design workflows. Are you interested in a computer program that combines construction drawings and 3D modeling in one software and in one model? If so, then you should check out the BIM program Archicad. Archicad leads the industry by enabling architectural and interior design firms around the world to freely design supported by innovative technology that expands as far as the imagination can stretch. Check it out by clicking on the Archicad link in our show notes. This is The Second Studio with myself, Marina, and our guest, Holly. Here we go. I am from Orinda, California. So for anyone not familiar with the Bay Area, it's east of San Francisco by about 45 minutes. Um, so grew up there. So kind of a Bay Area native and spent a fair amount of time in San Francisco proper. I went to UCLA, so I spent four years in Los Angeles, which I loved, and then moved back up to the Bay Area. So I'm, I've never lived outside of California, <laughs> mm, <laughs> yes. Californian through and through. So um, Orinda is, you know, people might not know, but it's a fairly suburban kind of setting, a lot of nature and things like this. Mm -hmm. um, crazy roads, to, crazy to, roads to get to the houses. I <laughs> yeah. mean, this is, you have to have some driving skills to live there, I feel like. <laughs> it's actually very scenic, um, although if you don't. If you get car sick, it's, that's not great. Um, but that's the case. And uh, you go down to UCLA for school. And what did you study? I studied mass communications. So not related to what I'm doing necessarily. Um, so I went in under a, gosh, what did I go in under? World arts and cultures major originally. And I spent about a year and a half in that. Hmm. And then I pivoted and changed majors to mass communications. I thought for most of college that I wanted to go in into broadcast journalism and UCLA does not have broadcast journalism or journalism as a major. So this was the next best thing. Um, stuck with that until I did an internship uh, senior year. I think it was fall of my senior year at UCLA at KABC in Los Angeles. And I severely disliked it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Wait, what happened? <laughs> Uh, I was studying, um, at the time I was doing an honors thesis in violence in the media and its effects on people's perception of their own personal safety. Wow. And then I spent my Fridays at KABC editing footage of like muggings and fires and <laughs> car accidents and shootings. And I was like, oh, I'm doing this job would be sort of contributing to that part of the culture, right? Of sort of exploiting the scarier, more dangerous aspects of life. And, and maybe that's not a positive thing. So, um, it made me change my mind about my career path. Um, and then I spent a little bit of time sort of whacking in the weeds, unsure what I wanted to do. I took the LSAT and considered law school. My parents heavily 
discouraged it for whatever reason, though I think I would have made a great lawyer. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I did not go. Uh, and instead, I kind of ended up in uh, an investment bank, actually, as my first job outside of college. Wow. So, okay. You had a bunch of different oh, things goodness, going on. Yeah. Um, when, after the first year um, in the, the culture, the arts, or whatever study that was that you mentioned, and you wanted to do <laughs> something in broadcasting, were you thinking that you would, a broadcast journalist is what you said? So Exactly. Like that, a news anchor. Like a news anchor, like a, a person anchor. in front of the camera with a microphone and all that stuff. Exactly. Somehow I could see that. I feel like uh, well, I mean, yeah, I think you would have been great at it. But so, what what made you want to do that when you like were you a kid and you were like, I want to be on TV, holding a microphone, and and you know, like presenting the news? Like, what what kind of trigger? Yeah, it? I know it's funny. You know how it is when you when you look back at your childhood, and I don't know what you both if you always wanted to be architects, but you know, if you look back on your childhood and kids want to be you know astronauts or ballerinas or open heart surgeons, and then eventually the reality of those jobs sets in, and it's <laughs> Maybe not. Um, I think, yeah, I think I was attracted to maybe being on television. Um, I liked the news growing up as a kid. We always discussed the daily news around our dinner table. So it was always kind of a, a topic in our household. And I was always aware of what was going on in the broader world. I think I saw it as a job that had an intersection of being, um, you know, kind of public facing, but also having a portion of informing the public and uh, learning about the world and teaching other people about it. So I think that was my my initial attraction. Interesting. Very culturally engaged. Um, but so then after after you do have to edit all these horrific scenes and you decide <laughs> this is not for me, um, you, you said you went to investment banking? Correct. So ultimately, after graduating, I moved home to Orinda, you know, penniless post-college student. And my parents were <laughs> charging me rent. Oh, so wow. <laughs> they were very serious about paying for college and cutting me off without a dime afterwards. They did it. They meant it. Um, wow. So I was paying them rent and desperately needed a job and desperately wanted to get out of my parents' house and live on my own. And I had been talking with a few friends about moving into San Francisco. And I looked, you know, at the time at rent and what it was going to take to survive. And um, I wanted to work in advertising at that point. I thought, well, this is maybe a good intersection of creativity and management. And I was mm -hmm. thinking more on the management side of uh, of it. Hmm. Um, I got an offer from one of the big ad firms in San Francisco. And to this day, I cannot remember now which one it was. You know, there used to be quite a few of them here. And I know they were on the Embarcadero, but no longer there. Um, they offered me, I think it was $19,000 for the first year. And so wow. I went home to my parents and said, yay, I got a job offer. It's to be an account, um, you know, rep in an ad agency, 19,000 for the first year. They've told me if I do a good job, then prove myself, you know, it'll give me a raise and it'll get much better after that, but I need help for the first year. And my parents said, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, so that line of we're, we're cutting you off after, after college, that was really a serious thing that they, oh, they were serious. Yeah. yeah. So in fact, my mother said, um, I suggest you get a job doing whatever it is that you can do for the most amount of money that you can make. And I was like, okay, I don't think you want me doing that. But <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what did your parents do for a living? Um, my dad was an executive for most of his life for multiple companies. Mm. Um, he also had a chain of Chuck E. Cheese's at one point, if you remember oh, Chuck wow. E. Cheese restaurants. Yeah. He sure. owned a few of those in Kentucky and Ohio, but for most of his career, he was partnered with a, um, I would call him like a wealthy creative thinker who would come up with these great ideas for companies and found them. And then my dad would step in and run them. So that was kind of the, the bulk of his career when I was growing up. He was really like a president or CEO of kind of multiple small private companies. Interesting. Um, so business minded. Yeah. Yes. And my mom uh, was a stay at home mother. So um, she did not work outside of the home until after my brother and I departed. And then she did some substitute teaching and some other things, but predominantly she was at home. Gotcha. 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 Well, $19,000 yeah. a year, and unless, <laughs> unless somehow you were born in the early 1900s, I don't think is an adequate amount of money to survive in a big city. <laughs> yeah. Not in San Francisco, not even back then, certainly not now and not then either. Um, yeah. yeah. So after my mom saying, get a job doing whatever it is you can do for the most amount you can make. I remember calling my friends in despair, like I have got to get out of my parents' house. I need a job. And one of my good friends from UCLA said, well, I just took a job at Hamburg and Quist and 
it's an entry level job. It's as a, you know, basically an assistant, right? Planning travel and making pitch books and doing whatever needs to get done. They're paying me thirty eight thousand dollars a year, and it's so much fun. The guys are hot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm, and I'm like just turned 21, right? Oh, so I was yeah, like, yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. They're going to pay me and there's cute guys. I'm in. Um, so yeah, I literally within a week, I think had a job at Hambrick and Quist and moved wow. out to the city. And that was sort of my my first job out of college, which I, over the next, what, I spent three and a half years there or so. I eventually moved into recruiting for them and then left there to take a recruiting job at the Law and Economics Consulting Group. Interesting. Did you like the work? Did you like working as a recruiter or for the recruiting company? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> but there were cute I guys. Mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, Hamburg and Quist, I loved the mm. company. It was, this was like the heyday of the small investment banks, right? So like Alex Brown, H&Q, super fun. I was on the trading floor when Netscape went public. You know, there was wow. just a lot of excitement, right? This is first dot com boom. It's a whole new world opening up. Mm -hmm. And yes, it was full of very smart people. Even the assistants, honestly, were all hired out of UCLA, Berkeley, Davis, many of whom went on to become bankers or do other great things with their lives. So, you know, they recruited well. They had a group of really smart people who worked really hard. Um, you know, we worked crazy hours. It was stay all night if you were asked to do whatever you were asked, no whining, no complaining, you know, so it definitely, I had a good work ethic already, but I think it helped teach me that too, that that was just the expectation and everyone did it. Um, and we worked together as a team. So I really liked it there. Um, you know, I moved into the recruiting more because I saw that as an opportunity to take a step out of the assistant role and into something with more meaning and more challenge and more interest. Um, you know, and I did do it for a few years there, then Law and Economics Consulting Group. And then I went from there to an internet startup where I really was the first hire by the three founders and recruited staff and outfitted the office and helped run the books and was just kind of like the functional right hand for yeah. the three mm -hmm. founders. So I learned a lot from that too, you know, in the end going through those three jobs, though none were the perfect fit for me, they definitely gave me some good skills that have helped me run my own business since then. Yeah, for sure. So, um, Obviously, now you have a design company. Do you ever think about like what would have happened if you had just stayed at one of these other businesses? No, I can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> that was never going to happen. <laughs> that was never going to happen. Okay, so then yeah. how how did this transition from all these different types of, of businesses and and you know works that you did? How did you go from that to then doing interior design and then starting your own interior design company, which is mm -hmm. not very successful. Like that seems to be quite a leap for a lot of people. It's not like you knew that you were going to do interior design from a young age, or maybe that was the case, but you, you know, you didn't do undergrad. It wasn't like the normal track necessarily. So what was that transition right, right. like? Um, so once the internet startup where I was, I was there for about a year and they started to implode just as many of them do run out of money. They were a little, I think early, to the game in terms of what they were trying to do. So they didn't make it. Hmm. Um, my husband was very kind and let me take a year off to just sort of think about what I wanted to do because I think he and I both knew I had ended up in this just from this circuitous route of just needing to have a job and, you know, not really being my passion or what I really wanted to do with my life. So he kindly said, you know, take some time off, think about what you want to do. Um, and in thinking about that, I really kind of went back to childhood and tried to think about what did I enjoy doing as a child, what interested me. And I had always been fascinated with architecture. I used to um, steal my mom's architectural digests and look through them. You know, she had them in the house. I don't think I ever saw her look at them. <laughs> Maybe she did, <laughs> but, but I definitely did. And I used to draw houses as a kid. Like, you know, I think other girls would draw like dresses or horses or whatever. I was drawing houses. So I briefly <laughs> considered, believe it or not, going back to architecture school. Um, wow. And funny enough, at the time, I think I was... 27 and I had this attitude like, oh, I am way too old to go back to college for an architecture degree, right? <laughs> Which now is hilarious. And, you know, I'm like, oh, that was silly. Um, but at the time I thought, oh, I'm too old for that. I can't go back to college for an architecture degree. I'll go for an interior design degree. Hmm. And UC Berkeley Extension had a program that was a great fit because it was nights and weekends aimed at adults, you know, working professionals, people of different backgrounds. So, um, so I attended UC Berkeley Extension's design program. And while I was there, got my first job 
at a company called Studio 104, so a small kind of one-woman firm here in San Francisco. Um, Madeline was kind enough to take me on, even though I was very green because I knew how to run QuickBooks. Um, and she was not into doing the finance side of the job, but because of the positions I had had prior, I definitely understood how to run the books. Um, and in exchange for that, she let me follow her around and I learned a lot. So it was nice to have some boots on the ground experience alongside my classes. That's interesting. Yeah. I want to hear more about the program at Berkeley. So how long was it where there, how large were the classes? Were most of the students um, older, like you said, or was it a mixed bag of people? Mm-hmm. Uh, real mixed bag. I would say there was everything from, you know, probably early twenties to people in their fifties, you know, making a wow. career pivot. Um, so really wide swath, um, taught by local architects and designers. And in fact, some of my designer friends now teach there because many of them attended that program, including, I'm sure you've heard of Jay Jeffers. He went there. Hmm. Um, I believe Dina Bandman did. She's definitely teaching there. So, you know, there's, um, you know, quite a history, I would say of, Bay Area, um, people in the industry kind of supporting the program and teaching there. Um, I had some great teachers. I loved my, um, I believe her name was Vesta Kirby, who taught color theory, which was my hands down favorite class while I was there. Um, I also got to dabble. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Why was it your favorite class? Um, probably it's the instructor. I think like any class you take, you know, having someone who's passionate about what they teach and well-informed about it makes all the difference. But I love color and I think just learning about the psychology of color and which colors work together and um, the color studies that we were able to do and everything from, you know, watercolor to construction paper to fabrics and hard materials. I just loved it. I think it was very um, tactile too with the Mm -hmm. materials that we got to work with. I also loved model building. You know, I know people talk about hating that in school, (laughs) their misery of being up till 3 a.m. with like, you know, the razor blade and the foam core. I I really loved building models. So I think for me, anything that was like hands-on and tactile was, you know, really engaged me. Interesting. Somehow I have this, this suspicion that you would have made a great architect as well. <laughs> or you would have enjoyed it's, architecture it's school for sure. It's never too late to go back to architecture <laughs> school. <laughs> I think I would have. It's funny. I also think I had this perception, which true or not, you two can tell me, um, that there was maybe too much math for me. I think I had this perception like, oh God, there's all this engineering and there's going to be this <laughs> super complex math and I'm not awesome at math and I would not be good at that. You know, So I think I had these fears like there were parts of it that I wouldn't be good at, but, um, but yeah, I think in a way I'm sort of a stymied architect. Like I, I really do love and admire, um, the work of great architects like you too. Well, to answer the question, well, it's very nice of you to say, to answer the question about math, I will say that, uh, at it's least in high school and in college, I was, I was decent at math and calculus and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I can also say very confidently that that has not directly helped me as an architect whatsoever. <laughs> and I was not um, good at math. I did not make it to calculus, so that tells you something about me. I don't think I, I, don't think I went past like algebra two or geometry or I don't know, whatever. That's where I tapped out. <laughs> uh, that's fair. That's fair. Because, you know, calculating the surface of like a rhombus or a football or a donut is not really... It's very helpful on the day-to-day life, you know? Um, (laughs) Not super helpful. (laughs) But, you know, just real quickly, it is an interesting thing. A a lot of people, including yourself, um, you know, have this perception that to be an architect, you must be good at engineering, or that's what architects do. But that's typically very far from the case. Um, Like, we don't handle the engineering. We have a a kind of instinctive sense for what will work and not work, but we don't do the Uh calculations. We don't figure out the size of the beams or do the structural portion, the de- do the design of the structural portion of the building. Um, I, think it's, I think it's more having a, a rational mind in the way you think about, you know, the architecture. And like you said, like having a, it's not a feeling, but it's kind of like understanding the, the, the laws of physics, you know, and like, you know, like when things can deliver out, like what, or how far do you think you can can deliver because, before right. it's going to break? We don't calculate those things. It's more like kind <laughs> yeah. of having a rough idea. <laughs> yeah. So right. That, right. And I'm sure some of that's experience yeah. too, right? Like yeah. school and, and experience over time of learning what actually can be built and designing to that. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's, that's true too. Um, was there anything about that Berkeley education process that was a surprise to you um, that was different than what you anticipated or was particularly challenging? I remember at the time, my main frustration was they didn't get into any kind of 3D software. So 
then, I don't know how the program has changed since, but we did a lot of hand drafting, which I loved, um, and then moved into CAD, um, which I also loved. And I really wanted to learn 3D, but at that time, that was not part of their curriculum. Now, granted, that's pre, you know, Revit, and there's so many new programs anyway that didn't even exist back then. But there was no 3D software instruction at that time, and I find the difference now is everyone I hire coming out of design school knows 3D software. You know, yeah. some of them can't hand draft, <laughs> but yeah. they can draft yeah. some 3D software. Yeah. No, I, I think that's the case. So when I was in school, at least the particular school that I went to for undergrad, it was sort of a transition, not sort of, it was a transition period. So the first few years were complete. Yeah. Years one and two were almost completely done by hand. And then we were switching over to mm. using 3D softwares, mm -hmm. but it is very strange like, I'm very grateful that that was the timing for me because yeah. it kind of gave me the ability to see a little bit of both sides. Um, you know, like we had to do rapidographs on on vellum and uh, what do you call it? The other material, mylar. which is mylar, which is like totally ridiculous. <laughs> but it, it, is a, it is an odd thing that now most students, who, when they graduate, at most, at, at best, they can do a really crappy sketch of what they're thinking, like if that and a lot of it's times true. they can't, and it's like I need to use rhinoceros yeah. or SketchUp or whatever the program is to to think. What uh, even the models? It's true. Now everything's three D printed or CNC. Yeah, yeah. You know, no one's kids don't model. know how to glue model, and yeah, I can yeah. cut pieces of cardboard anymore. Which I feel like it's always good to have a kind of a backup tool set you can go to. Like if your computer crashes, you're still able to you know move your think. project along and and think. Or if you're stuck within your three D model, just go back to a piece of paper and freely exactly. kind of explore options. Yeah, I agree, particularly on a job site, and I'm sure you see this too. But I mean, literally two or three times within the last few weeks, I've been on an active job site, and we've been working out detailing for something. You know, in this case, it was like a very complex marble layout for a kitchen we're working on, and being able to stand there with the contractor and the marble installer and sketch, you know, a section of what I'm looking for yeah. is crucial, right? But I agree, a lot of the students I'm seeing come out of school can't do it. You know, even just sort of rudimentary hand sketches can't do it. Um, I also feel like our education was pretty practical, like in terms of how things get made. And I'm often very surprised by the students that we hire straight out of design school sometimes actually don't know how a cabinet is made. So when they draw something, they will draw things where it's like, no, you can't actually put the door right up against the wall. Like <laughs> that doesn't work. You know, like we, need a, we need a filler strip and there's yeah, a hinge. Yeah. By the way, there's a handle and you don't want the handle to hit the door either. You know, just, just practical things, I guess, about how things are built that they just don't get. You know, there's so much emphasis, I feel like now on the computer skills and maybe not enough on the reality of what building is actually like. That's a super good point. Um, and uh, not to go too far into the to the to the rabbit hole of education, but I, I've always had this this kind of theory that as more programs get introduced and as they become more complicated, and students are required to learn them, and professionals are, um, well, there's only so much time in the day, and even if you're a student or professional who stays up and, and you work 14 hours a day, you're still limited. So if if all these new things you have to learn are introduced, then time is being taken away from something. I don't know what that other uh -huh. thing is. Maybe it is design. Maybe it's color theory. Maybe it's the constructability of thing. Who knows? Whatever it is, but something's being taken away. And I think it's it's yeah. really. I don't envy being the students now uh, because I think it's very difficult to try and learn. Let's say on the extreme Revit, for example, or ArchiCAD, or a BIM program, um, while also learning the things that you're describing because it's just it's brutal. <laughs> it's it hard. Is. It's pretty, so yeah. These softwares are, are are not easy to learn if if you are starting from scratch in particular. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I, I feel like so many of the programs seem to be aiming the students towards going to a giant firm like a Gensler, yeah, right? Where right. they're going to sit in a cubicle and do nothing but draft all day long. Um, fine. You know, <laughs> if that's what you want to do and that makes you happy, that's great. Right. But for a small residential firm like us, you know, I'm mm. looking for people who can wear every hat, you know, and do I expect them to have all of those skills coming out of school? No, but, you know, the broader the skills, the better, right? So understanding critical path, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. construction, understanding what goes into a set, being able to hand sketch a detail when needed, having an understanding of materials and what's appropriate for a certain situation, having some sense of fabrics and what's appropriate and how things are made and durability. You know, I'm kind of amazed with sometimes the lack of 
practical knowledge coming out of design school, you know, so it is what it is, you know, and I, I mean, I'll take people on because they're smart and they want to learn and yeah. they have, yeah. you know, the base level skills. And then I'm willing to teach them the rest. And they certainly learn a ton because we put them on job sites right away and they, you know, follow me around or the seniors around and we try to make sure they're really exposed to all aspects of the business. But I do feel like um, I wish the schools would have a little bit more practical knowledge involved. And the other thing I see missing, and again, we are, I'm going down the rabbit hole here, but <laughs> is the, um, you know, business side yeah. of design. Oh, gosh, which, yeah. Yeah. I, they don't seem to teach anywhere. Yeah. Nobody does. Right. Agreed. But if you want to establish your own firm, even if you've worked for someone else, maybe you pick up some little bits and pieces here and there. But I, I do think design schools could do a better job of at least offering, I don't know, one class, one semester of you know, what is the business of the industry? How does the industry work? I completely agree. Um, and I think, you know, when you when you graduate from school and let's say you went straight from high school to undergrad and you finished and you're probably like 22, 23, or maybe even a little bit older, you know, it's likely you're not going to start your own office right after you graduate. But I do think that just embedding um, the kind of meta information about the the business side of our industries mm -hmm. from an earlier age and if one's career just makes sense and would we'll probably have actually now that i think about it a long-term and greater effect like across the board for these professions which is is something i think historically that both the interior design and, and architecture offices have struggled with and not been great at and we've always mm -hmm. taught especially for architecture we always talk about how to solve these problems and i think Probably one of the solutions is what you said, which is, well, just at least introduce these things sooner. Because yeah. you yes. can, you it can... is ultimately a business, right? It's creative, yes. yeah. but it is ultimately a business. And yeah. you can rely just on experience to gain those skills. I mean, like you said, if you go work for a giant company, the business side, you're never going to see because there is a whole team dedicated to that. You're never going to be exposed. And if you work for a small company, you're probably going to be exposed, but it's most likely not going to be the right way to run a business, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, you learn what not to do. Yeah, That's yeah you know. but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And I think even for, uh, you know, staff in a smaller firm like mine, and we're, we're 12, right? So we're, we're not a big firm, but understanding, you know, why are billable hours important? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Why does it matter yeah. that you hit, you know, we have billable targets in our company. Our billable target is 85%. Why do I expect you to hit that? Because that's the number that we need to make this company work, you know? Yeah. So, but I think it's hard if people come into it with nothing but this idea of like this fluffy fantasy world of like, designing lovely things, that's great. That's certainly part of it. But you are also, even if you are not the owner of the business, you are part of a business. And understanding that it is a business and how the business works and why aspects of this are important, it also dovetails with understanding budgets, right? Clients' budgets, mm. um, construction budgets, you know, and again, very little, I find they have very little exposure to that side at all, you know, yeah. of the industry. So for for new hires or let's say the, the junior staff level people in your office, is it your approach to have them understand all these things because it because it doves tail dove tails? We definitely talk about it. So when we talk about billable targets, I explain why, right? That's mm -hmm. 85% is not a random number. It's actually like a pretty well proven number across multiple billable industries um, that staff needs to hit in order to make profitability. Um, so, you know, we do talk about the why behind the expectations for sure. Um, and I do try to educate you know, along the way, right, about why these things matter. Why do our initial budgets for our clients for our time matter? And why do we work to stick to those? Why does it matter that when we're on a construction project and we've been given allowances by the contractor, why is it important that we select within those allowances? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's hard, right? Because it's hard sometimes, I think, for designers not to say, oh, well, I was supposed to pick the $25 tile, but then I saw this $50 tile and it's so much prettier. Well, it is, you know, it's <laughs> of course not it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course it's prettier. You know? <laughs> yeah. um, that's interesting. I remember when I graduated from school, I was definitely the type of person who was just obsessed with uh, the, the creative or design aspects of things and had no clue about the business aspects and was frankly not very interested in it. And of course, uh, when you're a smaller office, you, you cannot do that. Uh, I mean, you won't succeed at all if, if right. you approach it that way. And um, a lot of my working experiences when I worked at other offices, uh, we were still, a lot of the employees were quite siloed from a lot of these kinds of 
parts of the business and the conversations. Yeah. And I had never fully understood it, in particular for the boutique size practices, because it seemed to me that even if you're just a drafts person or a person that's in charge of procurement or whatever it might be, that having some just base understanding, like you said, of why these things were important and why the boss is always thinking about these things uh, would be vital. Because when you're a small ship, everyone matters. And uh -huh. and it's kind of like, well, you know, if the business doesn't succeed, then you ain't going to exist at this business, you know, <laughs> we're, <Exactly. laughs> we're right. together. It's not it's not a Genzer where Genzer will continue whether or not I'm, I'm here or not or whether or not I, you know, keep track of these things. And in a small case, it's 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 not it's not like that. Right, exactly. So we all we all succeed together. We all fail together, right? And I'm very cognizant that yes, you know, I'm steering the ship. I'm the rainmaker. I'm responsible for bringing that in. But <laughs> making the business work is something that everyone here has a hand in. And so I think for employees, the understanding of the why something is important, you know, whether it's billable time or whether it's something else, you know, meeting a construction schedule, sort of it's easier to get people to perform if they understand why they're doing it. Yeah. So going back real quick to the Berkeley education experience, um, in that program, were you guys like you learning how to make cabinets or learning how upholstery is done? How does that part of the education happen? Mm -hmm. I mean, again, I can't speak to what they're doing now, sure. but in our day, yes, we did visit a cabinet shop. Um, we did visit upholsters. <laughs> we visited the design center. So there was some hands-on aspect to the business. And in fact, um, I actually didn't make it to the end of the program. I didn't mention that, but I dropped out without finishing. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> yes. Uh, so after Studio 104, so I was there for a while while I was at Berkeley, um, I bought my first house with my husband in Marin County and remodeled it. Mm. And then friends started coming over and saying, your kitchen looks amazing. Your bathrooms are amazing. This looks amazing. Can you help me with my kitchen? Can you help me with my bathroom? Pretty soon I had a bunch of work and it hit the point where I could not go to school and work mm -hmm. um, just given the volume that was going on. So I kind of felt like, well, I've had all the hand drafting. I've had the CAD drafting. I've had the color theory. I've had the presentations. I'm two thirds of the way through this program. I'm just going to drop out basically and start working. Um, so that's what I did. I wouldn't necessarily advise it. And in fact, funny enough, now I would never hire someone who dropped out of the <laughs> 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 I mean, Unless they prove themselves somewhere else. Fine. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah, you know. yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, but I did drop out and establish my own firm in 2002. Um, and I, I really just learned the rest of it by doing it, you know, either on my own house or, you know, clients houses where I was just very engaged because it was just me and I was small. So I drew everything. I was on mm. the job site constantly, you know, involved in every detail. Um, so yeah, sorry to segue off that, but yeah, so Berkeley, we did have some practical hands-on exposure, which helped a lot. And then I learned a lot by doing. Was there ever a part of you, I, I doubt now, because again, you're doing very well, but maybe in the early days where you, you thought to yourself, maybe I should have stayed around for that last third. No. <laughs> <laughs> Too busy, I'm guessing. Nothing against Berkeley, but uh, yeah, yeah. no, I mean, it was just kind of I got work and I kept getting work and I've been getting work ever since. So, and I, you know, I feel like the skill I didn't have, I sort of taught myself or I looked at other people's work or I tried to figure out how to make things better. I think because I have this kind of mindset of curiosity and continual improvement that even now after, you know, I've been in this industry for on my own for, you know, February will be 22 years. Um, I still learn new things all the time, and I'm always looking to optimize and get better at what I'm doing. Yeah, that's something that also st uh, stood out when we first met about you, um, is you have that kind of intensity in the spirit with how you practice and how you approach. I think probably everything would be my guess. Um, and so tied with that, I, I am also curious, you said your office is now 12 people or around mm -hmm. there, right? Which uh, is not huge but it's also not small if in my view it's not small i know i know for people in other industries 12 is like micro right, but for tiny, design yeah. it's, it's not necessarily the case um but th there's a big difference between an interior and design office that is let's say two or three people versus 12 was yes. there ever a moment 
in the past 20 or so years where you thought, I just want to stay at the size of myself and plus another and maybe someone to handle procurement, but I don't want to get beyond that because it gets into I mean, a lot of other problems uh, come with 12 people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, for us, it was kind of a natural growth progression of I chose to stay small for a long time because I also have three children um, who are now all teenagers. But um, for the early years, let's say the first decade that I had the company or more, I was either pregnant or nursing or <laughs> toddlers and pregnant and nursing. Um, so I was really juggling kids and work. And so it was really myself and one assistant for the first eight years or so. So I really did that where, you know, we only did two or three projects at a time. I drew absolutely everything. I picked everything. I ran every meeting. I was very hands-on. Um, from there, we kind of jumped to three or four people and we stayed there for a while. And then it really took off um, when my son went to, um, you know, school full time. And I kind of felt like, okay, now I really have the bandwidth. And what if I say yes, instead of saying no, you know, where could this go? Right. And if I don't try it, I'll never know. So we've been growing ever since. And I feel like now we're at a good size. I would like to stop here for a little while and stabilize. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will say the plus side of getting larger is, is that say yes factor, right. Of like when yeah. something exciting comes along, there <laughs> were times over the years where I was just too small and I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. You know, there were bandwidth limits and I said no to things that uh, I was sad about because I otherwise would have taken them. You know, now we generally, not always, but we generally have the bandwidth to say yes. And we have the staff and the infrastructure to run much, much larger projects. So like we're doing a ground up in Dominican Republic. That's very large. We're doing a large ground up in Sacramento, one in Incline, North Star. You know, we sort of have multiple large projects, which is exciting because they're all different from one another. And that's kind of what keeps me engaged in this industry mm -hmm. is the challenge and taking on different projects and for different clients and different styles, different geographies. Um, and if we weren't the size we were, some of those I would have had to say no to. So um, for now, you know, I'm, I'm happy with where we are. <laughs> uh, have you ever thought about venturing into other types of projects, types of buildings? So not just residences, but and I know mm -hmm. part of the answer, but like hotels, which would seem like a natural progression and mm -hmm. then restaurants or like other things or offices even. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I did my husband's venture office way back when. So I, I have dabbled in that a little bit. Um, and we did do one multifamily development that's slated to start construction this summer. Mm -hmm. um, so we have done some, you know, outside of the single family residence. I would love to do a boutique hotel. I think we'd be great fit for it, particularly having done this multifamily um, luxury condo development, which kind of feels like doing a hotel. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we definitely have the bandwidth and the knowledge to do it. And I have over the last couple of years purposefully hired staff that has experience on the commercial side of things. One of our staff members designed a couple of four seasons around the world. So we have the knowledge base now too. You know, I think there in years past, I might have been nervous about saying yes to that. Um, you know, now we're working internationally. We have people that have done those kinds of projects. We're, I think, well set up for it. And I would love to do, you know, small hospitality, yeah. um, restaurant. That would be fun. Yeah. I feel like doing a, a hotel would actually be easier than multifamily. Oh, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> it would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I was wondering is, was there, was there a clear point or project maybe in your career where you realized that you had a strong knack for this? Was there like a turning point where you said to yourself, I actually, I, this could be something and not just I'm doing it as a hobby, but this could be something. Mm -hmm. Um, gosh, I mean, the first project I had published was in 2007. Um, and I did a kitchen for some friends of ours in Pacific Heights. Um, I thought it was great. And this is, you know, so early and I'm so tiny that like, I didn't have a PR person. This is before Instagram, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, and really all my work was well, and still mostly is word of mouth. Um, and so I did this kitchen for some friends, they threw a party and the editor of California home and design happened to come to the house for the party. And the next day I get a phone call from California home and design saying, Hey, we'd love to publish this kitchen that you did. We we were at this party. And so we ended up on the cover of California Home and Design. And I think it was like July of 2007. And that's when I was like, oh, 
maybe I am good at this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess I always figured I was competent, right? But, right, right. But I was like, oh, this is like an outside person who, you know, is is ostensibly an expert at design who thinks that I, I've done a good job. So um, that was really helpful and um, and I guess reinforced for me that, you know, that I, I was by maybe some people's outside measures um, good at what I was doing. That's an interesting that's interesting, though, like the psychology of that, because on the one hand, I think it's easy for people to say, and, and it is partially true, that things like publications and awards don't really mean a whole lot. But mm -hmm. I would say subjectively, if, if you're a person who achieves any of those things, it actually does have a big impact on your outlook about yourself, at mm -hmm. least for me. Uh, it's an me odd too. thing. It does. And I feel like also when, <laughs> well, you know, when you start your own practice and, you know, you haven't worked for 20 years or you work maybe for just a few years, you feel like you don't know everything and you're kind of like, you're, you're still bu syndrome. building yourself. And you do get some time to time, like the imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. like you're like, am I actually faking it until I make it? Or am I actually <laughs> good at this? Like, <laughs> it's, it, it's hard to tell, yeah, right? Yeah. So for sure, when you see your work being published in a magazine that's, you know, known among like being like presenting good work, then you're like, okay, well, this is a good sign. I'm actually not an imposter. <laughs> yeah, I still I still get imposter syndrome from time to time, you oh, know, really? 20, 20 plus years on. So. <laughs> I feel like that's the nature of the game, though. I mean, even, I, I feel like for every project that we do even if on paper it would seem quite similar to the previous like the stats of it like it's a different it's a different side it's a different client it's a different criteria and every everyone it's kind of like i don't, I don't know if we're how is this going to work out exactly mm -hmm. no and, and there is there is the the design aspect of being an imposter and then there is also like the the business aspect the social aspect of you know working with people like making it work on all of the different levels for a project like maybe sometimes mm -hmm. the design ended up great but the relationship with the client got killed you know and mm. yeah you know you can feel like you didn't really you know succeed right, you didn't kill it on all fronts yeah yeah, yeah. Right. And it's, it is a tough industry that way i mean it's I can't think of many others that are unique as this and it's challenges across so many facets, right? Being, yeah. especially if you own and run a firm. So the expectation that you are constantly creative, that you are bringing fresh new ideas, but also that you have to understand how to run a firm. So you have to have enough, you know, sort of finance experience or know-how to make that work and then managing the clients, you know, which is a whole other talent and interfacing with builders and colleagues, right? Like if architects and designers work together, how do we interface? How does that work? It just requires so many different diverse skills. It's it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy to succeed at all of those all of the time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, when you started to bring on people and the office started to grow, what were some of the, the challenges with that? Because I've said many times on this show, right. and it, I think it is true, that the skill set required to be a good designer and have, let's say, a one-person show and work with clients, select the right items and all, all the stuff, um, that alone is just very difficult to do. But that is also very different from running an office that has six, seven, eight, ten, twelve people in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. Organizationally, I think you know, figuring out the right level of staffing, the right positions of staffing, um, you know, kind of right sizing the firm for the work that you have, um, getting the blend of skills and talents with people. And maybe this is where, again, my recruiting background probably comes in handy. You know, I have had these weird little experiences along the way in terms of like having to run the books for a startup, really helpful in understanding finance, you know, like yeah, sure. I've been a recruiter. I kind of know what to look for on people and I understand, you know, how to recruit talent and the kind of mix of people that you need and not just their skills, but also their personality. It's, um, you know, in any small office, if you have someone whose personality is unpleasant or divisive it doesn't matter how talented they are as a yeah, designer okay. it's not going to work you know we're, yeah. we're small <laughs> so for us when i'm looking for um teammates to join us i'm always looking for people that have the skills and the talent and that also have a personality that's going to mesh with the firm and that have the work ethic that i'm looking for that's interesting because i feel like when it comes to hiring people there's there's the 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 there's this, a list of very important criteria, which is almost just the baseline, like the skill set, like the interests, and and all these kinds of things. 
But assuming that's taken care of, and I think that the thing now is that there are potentially a lot of younger designers and architects who meet those criteria. Mm -hmm. Then the the rest, of like sixty percent of it afterwards, is just whether or not they're going to be a good fit. Which yeah. which I know for for people who are looking for jobs can be frustrating because you could say to yourself, well, on paper, look, I've done all this work and I have even let's say an extra few years of experience than that person. Why wasn't I hired? And I. I think it it's just for better or for worse. It just comes down to whether or not the person interviewing you likes you. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think there's that. You know, li likes you personally and is aware of who else is in the office, yeah. right? Yeah. And sort of those people, their personality, the needs that they have for their work environment. Um, you know, for me, I'm, I'm. It's not just whether I like them. I'm sort of looking at them as how is this person going to mesh with our entire team? Um, and is that going to work? And, you know, we, we've had a few over the years where I, we've misfired, sure, over the last 20 years, a couple of times where we've hired someone on paper, they're great, they interview well, and then they get in here and <laughs> they're not great, you know, yeah. for whatever reason, like personality or they lack work ethic or whatever it is. Um, you know, and I've, I've learned over the years to also get swifter about when people don't work, you know, just yeah. kind of saying like, this doesn't work, let's part ways and move on um, rather than trying to, mold or shape somebody you know you can teach the skills but you're not going to change their personality so that i've learned oh that's also super well yeah, put i agree yeah. with it also and and i remember <laughs> so many places i worked at i'm like clearly this person does not fit here what are we doing like <laughs> and, it, and it's super it's so important for the the you know what people say like office culture right it's very much of a, a a chemical reaction like whoever you put together in the same office and and how the energy is going to flow or not flow in the office um, I've, I've, you know, one of the office I worked at, I started, we were maybe like 40 people and there was like a really great energy office culture. Everybody was just together supportive and we grew up to 90, 90 something wow. people. And, you know, at this scale, like you got to get more pockets and groups of people rather than like one mm -hmm. big entity. And you could kind of start seeing a bit more of the individual personalities coming out of, of the group. Mm -hmm rather than like the cohesiveness of the group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think you're right. It's super important. Mm -hmm. I love visiting people's office is and I've been to your office and I can say for, at least from the time that I was there, it seems like other people have good vibes around them. <laughs> Thank um, you. I think they do. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's a true thing. Sometimes I step into an office and the six, the spider sense is tingling. I'm like, this is a weird place. I don't know what's going on here. Like after I leave, but some, something's off. I doesn't feel right. Um, I mean, it's just purely instinctual, but I think there is something about it for sure. Um, you can feel the, you can feel the energy and the buzz when people are mm -hmm. clicking together. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. And in our industry, right, we're creative. So you have to have people that can sort of spark off one another, or toss around creative ideas, mm. you know, and do so respectfully yeah. um you know so th that's kind of what i'm looking for is you know that ability to speak your mind and i do encourage everyone at every level in our firm i what i tell people is i don't really care about titles like okay everyone has one but to me it's like i you know if you have a great idea i want you to say it i don't want you to yeah. feel like oh i'm i'm the junior or i'm the intern you know and just sit there quietly it's like that's not what i'm paying you to do i'm paying you for your ideas so bring them to the table and you know everyone be respectful about everyone else's ideas. And, you know, to me, it's kind of the, the best thing wins. So whoever brings it in, I'm, I'm happy to have it. And, um, I try to cultivate that environment where people feel like they can be a team member and also bring their creativity out and shine. So talking about your design process, when you embark on a new project, let's say hypothetically, you have this client who approaches you and says, I'm interested in using you to do the design and intro design of my, my home or, or hotel, <laughs> let's say, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Um, like what is your guys' process, uh, to, to help the client and go and go through with them from, you know, I don't know if we have to go from beginning to end, but like, what is the mm -hmm. process like? Mm -hmm. On the, early end, um, usually we'll have them fill out a form. So over the years, I've developed a client questionnaire that is very helpful, um, kind of delves into everything from color and texture likes to how people live. Do they have collections of things? Um, I find that it just helps cut to the chase on a lot of conversations about yeah. important things and things that, you know, if you ask somebody sitting across the table, well, you know, how do you feel about plaid? What, what's your favorite color? You know, sometimes they're sort of taken aback and they <laughs> can't really answer it. But if you give them a questionnaire, most clients will come back with some, some really great stuff that just helps. Right. It's like, I remember one of our clients came back and said, well, I hate the color yellow. And it was like, okay, 
<laughs> great. Good to know. We'll be avoiding that. Um, so the questioner is great. Um, if clients have a Pinterest board or if they've made their own mood boards, which I found like, you know, 70% of the time when people come to us, they have at least some imagery they've collected in some way that expresses what they're after. That's incredibly helpful because I find trying to do that verbally is a challenge, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I've over the years learned, you know, I've had clients come to me and say, oh, I'm, I'm modern. I'm really modern. I, I like modern things, you know? And then I'll say, great, you know, can you show me some pictures? And when they're showing me pictures, I'm going, well, that's not what I would call modern, right? Yeah. I might call that transitional or, you know, so the verbiage is difficult, particularly for people that aren't in the industry, right? They can use words for things that aren't correct. And so I find the images just cut through any confusion on um, using words to describe what someone's after. So I love getting visual imagery. Um, so that's usually the basis from which we start, obviously, if it's, um, you know, new construction or remodeling, and there's an architect that's already on board, um, meeting them and looking at their plans and having a conversation with them about um, the conversations they've had with the client. You know, sometimes they've been on six years, a year or whatever before us, you know, mm -hmm. so they have a lot of background on kind of how they got where they are with the design. So I always want to understand from the architect, um, their relationship with the client, their understanding of what the client values, what they're going for stylistically, how the architect and I will work together, our firms will work best together is an important conversation early. Um, and then certainly with clients from there, the next step usually for us is moving into kind of our version of the mood boards. And I like to start with a very kind of high level mood board that captures the vibe we're going for in the project. And that mm -hmm. means that you know, will there be furniture and fabrics on it? Yes. Do I often put on other things? Yes. Like I did one for our Beverly Hills project where, um, you know, there were like cars and watches and, you know, things like that. The guy was a watch collector and he was into cars and he had this very James Bondy vibe. So just to show him that I understood that and I understood, you know, what he was going for, the initial mood boards were actually much more directional in terms of feel and mm -hmm. not so specific in terms of furnishings. Um, so that's, kind of in a nutshell where we start and then obviously it gets more granular from there yeah that makes total sense um i like the the observation of the statement about the confusion when we're yeah. just using words to describe design and architecture um it's 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 not it's impossible really it could um, be it could I be mean, style it could also just be word like you know i want something bold and then you show something bold and the, the client is like oh no that's like too much yeah, <laughs> and i'm yeah, like yeah. okay well you know bold means something so visuals right. really help they do um i was wondering with that part of the process if you ever have the challenge or you, you find it difficult to get clients not to be fixated on specific things um because I think early in that process, for us and then uh, for you too, based on your description, it's not about, we're not selecting the final material on, in that first, uh, you know, mood board. Um, we're just mm -hmm. trying to understand, uh, it, it, uh, not even direction yet maybe, but just understand who you are, to gauge mm -hmm. your reaction exactly. to stuff. Um, do you, is it ever difficult to to get people to, to step away from Pinterest and not have them just always go back to, I want that thing that's on the wall? <laughs> Sometimes I find, um, I would like the most frustrating thing I see is when their Pinterest is very scattered. So we do sometimes get people right. where <clears throat> they'll give us a link to a board and I'm like, whoa, these things are, <laughs> these are not all in the same lane, right? There's like three different houses going on here. So uh, I, I would say the biggest challenge I see is in that where sometimes, you know, well, I like this, but I like this and I like this and I like this. Well, great. You know, and, and all those things individually might be fantastic. Do those things all belong together in the same space or even in the same house? No, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so sometimes I find explaining that to clients can be very difficult. Kind of like, I get that you like this and this, and they are both great. They do not belong together, right? So we have to kind of pick a lane. And what I like to say is like, pick a lane and stay in the lane. <laughs> <laughs> stay in the lane. <laughs> and that's a very, very important to stay stay in the lane. Um, we joke often kind of about that. It's, it's similar in a way where one of the very common things that happens in, in the design process or projects uh, that is frustrating for a lot of architects and designers is it's usually when the client goes on a vacation or takes a brief kind of hiatus from the project. And you're laughing because you know it, that they, they see something cool, which is great, but they come back and they say, let's do this instead, or let's throw this into the mix. And um, which is which can be very productive and produce very, very interesting results. 
But for the architects we speak with, a lot of times they're like, oh, <laughs> what are you talking about? This is not related to, you know, the last year and a half that we've been uh, building mm-hmm. up on. Mm-hmm. I have definitely seen it happen. Um, the most extreme example was, and I know these clients will know who they are and they will not mind my saying this, that <laughs> we spent a year with an architect figuring out how to remodel an existing home that they bought that was Spanish style. And it was big and great lot and all that, but not not a great house. And so we were really going to sort of morph it into something like cool and Moroccan vibes and modernize it to the degree possible. And the clients at one point said, you know, oh, we're just, we need to take a break. We're going to travel this summer. We'll come back and sort of, you know, pick this up. But we had really gotten, you know, I would say all the way towards a permit set. Um, they came back and they were like, you know what? We don't want that anymore. We want glass walled and concrete. And so <laughs> in the end, we tore it down. We took all the plans and just wadded them up and threw them out and just started over entirely. And the the end result was awesome. And it was definitely the right choice. Um, You know, the less extreme examples, certainly I have seen people come back from vacation, like I fell in love with Southern Spain and now I want a tile roof. And you're like, Ooh, that's not what we're building here. Um, I, I feel like it's worse for the architects, right? Like for me, I can sometimes pivot people to like, I get that you love that. Great. I'm happy to buy like a Spanish antique chest that we can put in this bedroom, right? That you get a little bit of that vibe and then we'll put an antique mirror over here and it it works. You know, I think it's much harder for you all because you're talking about things that are far more permanent (laughs) and I would argue far more important, right? So having someone who then tries to shoehorn in architectural details that do not work with the style of the house would be much more upsetting than, you know, <laughs> than like trying to force me to use some kind of pattern or, you know, some piece of furniture that I don't love. You know, I can, I can usually get away with kind of like, I hear you and I understand that you want this vibe or you're now in love with this color and okay, we'll find a way to get it in there in a way that's appropriate, but it's probably a little less hard for me than it is for you when that happens. Yeah. I, I and, would tend to agree, but you know, that makes me think that there's a very interesting difference generally between the interior design portions versus let's say the architecture where I think I think you got interior designers and designers have generally more freedom to introduce a greater variety of things into one space which Mm -hmm. makes it very very interesting like I'm very intrigued by this idea that you would mix something very old and very new and they are they don't match each other but they're complementary and they and they just work Versus, I think in the case of a lot of architecture, it's that that definitely does happen for sure. But I think it's harder to do, and we I don't think we have nearly. I, I know we don't have nearly as much flexibility because um, I know we just don't. It's it's everything mm-hmm. locks into place, and either it locks into place or it doesn't. It's very, at least in my view, it's very very black and white. It's very mm-hmm. yeah, it's very hard. Mm-hmm. You know, so we 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 worked on a project once, and I think the clients was was too excited about his project, which sometimes could be detrimental to the project and was also very indecisive. So we kind of had to explain that y- you can't just put all of those you know, bits and pieces into this house because it's just going to look like you know, kind of like a very bad version of a showroom, you know, a showroom. Right? right? That's the word we use. It's very like often. you can't use this yeah. type of, you know, like stone facade on the exterior and then like wood cladding and then like modern details. Stone. It's like, yeah. n- no. And if you were to do that, well, maybe a new, a new construction would be a bit more, a bit, a bit easier than, than a remodel where you have to already deal with the existing portions, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. in itself already mm-hmm. has so much embedded into it. Yeah. And I don't know if you do sometimes how we've gotten over this with clients, particularly if it's interior architecture, like let's say if we're doing a kitchen, right? And someone comes back with like, oh, I want this color or I want this, you know, and it's something that I feel like, "Mm, that's not a great fit. You know, I have had success over the years with being like, fine, I'm going to show you what you want, right? And we'll 3D it and we'll put in what they want. And then next to it, we'll put what I want. You know, And nine out of 10 times when it goes up on the screen and it's like, this is what you asked for. And next to it is what I think we should do. And here's why I think this is what we should do. I usually win, not always, but, but I do think sometimes people don't, they can't conceptualize, right. Something from this to this, you know, they don't understand scale. They don't understand how that material or that thing they're asking for relates to everything else in the space. They just can't, that's why they're not doing our jobs, right. They can't, they can't visualize it. So I think sometimes saying, 
fine, let's let's show you what you're asking for. Let's see if you like it when you see it. I mean, you know, if you put it up and they love it, okay, you're in trouble. But you know, I feel like sometimes <laughs> you are in like, trouble. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's right. That doesn't really work. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think that's true. I think that's true. And and most people, and, and this, of course, we're not blaming the clients because they aren't trained in this. They they don't right, have exactly. the capacity, or for sure, not nearly the capacity as the professionals to to just visualize stuff. And I think putting it exactly. in front of them does help. It is funny though, for that one out of ten times where they love it, that's when you know, as a as a designer or an architect. Ah, uh, okay. Well, I, yeah, I may lose this one. The, yeah, and I don't know how the rest of the project is going to going to go. We we have we've had clients before who have who have had um, strong design backgrounds, kind of earlier in their careers mm-hmm. or in their education, and they just have what we call they just have a good eye. And man, yes. it makes the biggest difference in the world because you show them stuff and they just get it. They're like, yep, they that was the best one. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. That is the best one. You, we don't even have to have a conversation yeah. about it. And they don't need to see, you know, it, it, in some cases, it, 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 it makes our work actually go a lot faster because we don't it have does. to produce all this kind of counter evidence or however you would describe exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, it does. It certainly helps if clients have good taste, you know, one way or another, whether it's that, you know, they're into art or they're into fashion or, oh, yeah. you know, even film, right? People who I feel like are big film buffs and really sort of study the set design and film. It's like they get it on some level, but there's a lot of people who really don't. And then I hope, and I'm sure you hope that in the end, they trust us as the professionals, right? It's like, I'm not going to go to my accountant and start nitpicking how they do a spreadsheet or why they do it this way. And so, you know, sometimes when I hit that resistance from a client, that's the conversation I'll try to have too, is say, Hey, look, you, you hired me for a reason, right? I'm, I'm the professional at this. I've been doing this for 20 years. You know, if you are going to hire me and you're going to work with me, it would be great if you had some trust in what I'm telling you and, you know, belief that I know the right decision here, you know, the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I think is there's also this interesting and and fine line between a client who is very invested in the project, which can be very powerful in 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 a positive sense. But there is also kind of a threshold where sometimes if they get too involved, it's actually to the detriment of the project. Mm -hmm. And now a little break for our show sponsors. Dear architects and designers, do you know the current spend on your budget? Can you forecast your next six months of performance? Do you know the status of all your projects? Have your team's hours been effectively allocated? If you struggle to answer these questions quickly and easily, then you need to explore Monograph. Monograph is a performance management platform. It helps you and your firm make better day-to-day decisions and anticipate what's next with powerful forecast. It's designed by architects for architects. With Monograph, you get less obscurity and more visibility, less ambiguity and more clarity, less admin and more design. You have to see it to believe it. My dear architects, when you're designing a modern home or a building and you need to spec a door and a window system, then you should check out Skyframe. Skyframe is a Swiss company and the world's leading frameless sliding doors and window system. Their products are developed and manufactured in their own facility in Switzerland. And they have numerous types of doors, including the classic sliding door system, The arc, which is for curved glass facades. The slope, which is for panels tilted at an angle. Pivot, which is for pivot doors. And hurricane, which is for project in high velocity slash hurricane zones. You can learn more by clicking the Skyframe link in our episode notes. The second studio podcast is made possible by support from Autodesk. Autodesk has been part of the design conversation since 1982, providing the tools that help architects around the globe imagine and create beautifully designed, memorable buildings that people love and admire. Autodesk supports the work of the second studio, bringing the architecture community together, sparking curiosity and leading vibrant interviews with the industry's visionaries and thought leaders. The second studio works hard to carry the architecture conversation forward, and Autodesk is proud to contribute to this podcast. You can learn more about Autodesk by clicking the link in the show notes. So one question with with that, I guess, or in general, is what do you look for in, let's say, the ideal client or project that you're going to take on? Mm -hmm. Um, So ideal client, I would say I like people that do have a style direction in mind. I often find it hard when you get people who have no idea, you know, Um, not to say I couldn't prescribe it. And if they're open to that, that's fine. But I find sometimes people that have no idea also have a very hard time making decisions and getting there, you know, Mm. Um, or it takes Mm. a lot of whacking in the weeds to sort of figure out where we're going. So I do like people that, you know, come out of the gate with some sense of what they like and what they don't like and are able to express that. However, that is visually, however, um, 
you know, I tend to like clients who are good at what they do and they understand mm. that there's value in working with someone else who is good at what they do. So they hopefully respect me, not only as a person, but as a designer and that they have some, uh, trust, you know, a level of trust that I know what I'm doing. Um, and so they can focus on their job and let me focus on my job. Um, you know, beyond that, I like people who have realistic expectations around time and money, which I'm sure, you know, in our industry is often very difficult that people don't really have a concept of how long it takes to yeah. get through the design work required for something, how long permitting might take, how long construction might take. And, you know, reality is around costs, right? And it's, you know, unfortunately, we do see people quite a bit who sort of want the pie in the sky, you know, like they want the Ferrari, but they're on a Toyota budget and it's very <laughs> difficult. You know, it's like, I always yeah. say, I, you know, I wish I had a magic wand and I could make this happen for you the way you want it to, but it's there are possible. realities yeah. of what construction costs and I'm not a miracle worker. So, um, you know, I think people who either get it coming in or at least are willing to listen to the realities about time and money, because, um, I find if people have very unrealistic expectations going into a project, then it's just, going to be an uphill climb the whole way. Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. We, you know, v vetting clients um, is a big part of what I think any person who owns a design or architecture office has to do. And having those real realistic expectations is one of the number one priorities, aside from also personality fit, because if similar to hiring a person, if, if they have yeah. all the other stuff, but I get the sense that we are not the right fit and they're going to be difficult to work with based on who we mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. then we just won't do it because, mm -hmm. you know, the other thing too is that people maybe don't think about this when, they're, when they are on the client side at the beginning is that you are potentially signing on to work with this person for at years. least a year, probably more than a year, one to five years, you know, mm -hmm. and it could very well be the longest and most complex project the client has ever been involved with, period, on its own. And so, so anyway, that's just a way to say that for us, vetting clients is very, uh, very important. Well, and you can produce yeah. your best creative work if you, if you feel like it's becoming work in a way, right? Like if, if you yeah. don't have that good relationship and you're afraid you're not going to pitch the right thing or the client's being difficult, it's tormenting your brain and therefore you can create at, at your best. Yeah. Yeah. It's very true. If they're, if they're unpleasant, um, you know, for me, and I've had a, a couple over the years, you know, who did turn out to be, unfortunately, just sort of unpleasant people. It really casts a pall over the whole project. And it is very hard to bring your best self creatively, right? You sort of reach the point of like, well, this person is not nice and doesn't appreciate what I'm doing. So why would I bother to try to do my best? Right. I mean, I hate to say that. I, you know, no, I yeah, always try to bring my best, but yeah, but you're right. It's, it's hard to bring it creatively and do your absolute best if someone isn't, um, you know, at least like somewhat appreciative and respectful of that. And I think this probably applies to to any industry, but it, it is fascinating because we speak to a lot of architects, obviously, and designers that everyone, all those, both of those people have the same opinion of what we just described. It's not, it's not worth it. And I think everyone goes through, a few of them sneak through because <laughs> you, mm -hmm. you know, but it happens like once or twice. And then after that point, you're like, I'm not doing that again. I will do everything I can yeah, to I avoid that because it's not, it's not good for, for anybody. No, um, mentally, it's so difficult. My husband once said to me, I don't understand, like, you know, because I had this one difficult client and I relayed the whole thing. And he said, can't you tell when you meet these people? And I said, look, no. anyone can act sane for an hour, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. which exactly. often is how long I meet people before they sign a contract and, and we're off, you know, though I have over the years gotten much, much better at asking the right questions mm -hmm. and probing a little more and really, you know, like I think you brought up spidey sense, right? Sort of letting my spidey sense on like, mm, what kind of person does this seem like? Because you're right. If I am going to be dealing with them for years, you know, I want to make sure it's someone that I'm going to be able to get along with and work well with. You know, tied into this too, I think one of the interesting, I think differences between most clients um, and then most professionals is that the professionals or the architects, designers, and even the contractors to a degree, like we're always trying to gain as much information from the client as possible upfront before we sign the contract or before we start any work for sure. And oftentimes the amount of information we want is far, far, far greater than what the client thinks they need to provide, which is an understandable, understandable difference because they don't do what we do. But right. like, I want to know not just the budget schedule and scope. I want to know who they are, their goals, their sensitivities. I, I like, I want to know everything. And that require and sometimes that can be 
a lot of that can be achieved in a concise period of time if the client has kind of done their homework and they have their other ducks in a row. But a lot of times, it, honestly, I would say it would take like two to three meetings uh, for, for us to actually get that information, uh, which, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, it's not feasible. Someone doesn't want to meet with you three times for one and a half hours each time before they, 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 you, know, <laughs> right. you decide you're going to work with them. Like it doesn't work that way sometimes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, um, you know, it does help, obviously, if there are other people already on the project. So I do benefit sometimes, right, yeah. from if the architects are there before me, I will, <clears throat> I will call the architect, right, and just kind of say, how's it going? You know, what's this client like? How's it been so far? You know, and, and try to get an honest assessment of sort of what, what the client is like. So I, I occasionally get lucky and, you know, there's the architects there before me and I get a little intel on what I'm potentially walking into. And I, I still remember I... Um, I had a call with Steven Sutro once about a client and mm. um, I remember him saying, and I, I don't think it's giving anything away because he has a lot of clients, so I'm sure they won't know who they are, but he said something along the lines of, if I had to rate a client on a one to 10 scale, this one would be like a two or a three. And I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm going to pass. <laughs> Still would love to work with you someday, but this is not the project. <laughs> and he's like, why are you passing this project? <laughs> well, Oh, he was more or less warning me like, yeah. mm, you know, yeah. No, no, that, that's for sure the case. Um, that, that, and it, it just makes sense again for everybody involved, including the client. Um, on the subject of collaborating and working with architects and contractors and everyone else, I want to know, um, how do you approach it? What's your ideal um, collaboration team scenario? And also, do you prefer to be brought on a project from the very, very beginning as opposed to, uh, let's say, the architects, as we've seen sometimes, they get through all the, quote, architecture or the ex exterior stuff, and they have a floor plan, and they're like, okay, now we need an intro designer. Designer, come in and, like, do your thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which I disagree yeah, so. with, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Good, I'm glad you disagree. So, do I. Um, so let's see. I yeah, when I prefer to come on the project, um, definitely from the get go, and I will always tell clients that the best projects result in building the team upfront from mm -hmm. go. Um, I think the best projects we've ever done have been ones where we and the architect are hired more or less simultaneously, and even ground up, develop the house together. Um, there's just different aspects of the way that we work, you know, the way architects look at things and the way that we look at things are different. And I feel like having all those eyes on and a collaborative process between us and the client. And I often also advocate for bringing on a contractor and under a pre-con agreement um, mm -hmm. as well. I feel like really results in the most linear process and the best product, having all of us work together as a team. So that is always my preference. We, of course, do get jobs where, yes, you know, maybe it's already to a permit set and, you know, oh, now we have to pick finishes. Okay. Now we need the designer. And I, you know, those can be more challenging because sometimes I look at the plans and it's like, Ooh, I would have maybe done this differently. Or, you know, I've even had ones where I've delved in with a client and said, <clears throat> you know, why is the kitchen laid out this way? And I might've done it this way. And they're like, yeah, well, we don't like the kitchen. We don't know why why it was drawn that way. And it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, and then we're, <laughs> we're sort of redesigning things. So like <clears throat> something, some communication breakdown sometimes happens in there. And, you know, then we end up sort of like finessing a bunch of things. And I would, I would rather just get it right uh, the first time. Totally. So um, yeah. And then, sorry, what was the first question? I know that was a two-parter. What was the first I forget parter, the but... first question, <laughs> but, but uh, picking up on what you just said, I, I agree with entirely. And we have seen those cases ourselves too. And it's an interesting thing. So, so the, the specific example of a client gets partway through a pro sometimes really far into a project. And then the, a new person comes on the architect or designer or somebody, and they tell that person, guess what? I don't like this at all, actually. And uh, from our perspective, um, you know, we kind of scratch our heads. Like, how did you, well, if you don't like it, then why is it here? And why has it been in the right. project this way for so right. long? But right. we, I've seen it enough times now where it's not just a one-off kind of oddball scenario. It, it happens more often than I would have previously mm -hmm. thought. And uh, what that means, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I have guesses as to why it occurs, um, but I, I guess I guess I'm I guess what I'm saying sort of is that for any clients, if you don't like something, you should always say that you don't like it. But you, I think also usually in those situations, there's a underlying and deeper rift that's taking place between the client and then that, that professional where they mm -hmm. decided not to tell that person subconsciously or consciously. 
and that's usually indicative of other problems in the in the project as well mm -hmm. um, yeah i agree and i've seen i've definitely seen it multiple times like you and i agree that there are so many times where i think how did this get this far right without someone saying stop i don't like that let's let's change this and i don't know if it's you know, fatigue or just sort of lack of confidence on the client's part about speaking their mind about what mm -hmm. they want, but it, it does, it does happen quite a bit. Um, and you know, and that causes delays, right. Um, for whatever reason, then we're back into redesigning things or we're reselecting materials for the exterior. I had one in Tahoe where the client told me when we got hired that they didn't like anything on the outside of the building and asked <laughs> us to reselect re it. Right. And, you know, I was like, Oh, I don't know if I can do that. You know, and I, I called the architect and luckily, you know, they're great and we work with them quite a bit. And I was like, you know, Hey, I just got to tell you, this is what the client said. And I'm not sure how you got to this point, but, and he's like, look, we've tried and tried and tried and we, we can't seem to figure out what this client wants. So if you guys want to take a crack at it, have at it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. We've, we've tried <laughs> yeah. and we can't get there. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, <laughs> yeah, collaboratively we got there, but you know, that is the kind of thing where I'm like, how, how a year in is this that you're telling me that you do not like the any of the clouding on the exterior of the building you know <laughs> yeah it's it's hard too because i mean i do think it's incumbent on the professional to also convey a sense of openness so the client feels comfortable saying what they mm -hmm. want to say but mm -hmm. even if that takes place i mean i think part of it too is these projects they're just it's hard it's hard they're complicated uh this is a lot of pieces and i don't know odd things happen like this um i was wondering when you are working with an architect, in particular when you're brought on at a later phase, if there's ever a challenge because of essentially ego, that someone's feelings are being hurt because now we have this new person coming in, or maybe even even if you're at the at the part of the project from the beginning, this other person who I maybe have not worked with, I don't know, and they're offering their opinions to us or the client, and you know, just kind of some friction takes place because of that. <laughs> yeah, I have a good story and I guess I can relay it because I'm pretty sure this architect uh, does not like me and we will not be working together. So um, <laughs> uh, this is yeah, this is a client. This is actually quite recent. It was probably a year ago. Um, the client approached us. They already had uh, the architectural set was fairly progressed. It was getting close to permit set level. Um, we took a look at it and it was one where I felt like okay, given all the conversations that we have had with the client about their desires, there are a lot of things I'm seeing that are not meshing with what I'm hearing, right? Mm -hmm. um, these people want to have children. The bedrooms are way on one end of the house. The laundry is on the other. But hey, there's this big closet right by the bedroom that would make a great stacked washer dryer laundry near the children's bedrooms. You know, just certain practical things. You know, mm -hmm. husband and wife both work from home. She's a high-powered tech exec the architect had put her office through the laundry mudroom. She had to go what? through the laundry mudroom to get to her office in the home, whereas his office was this much more like premier, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> and, mm. and I was like, hmm, there just seems to be some things that are a little a little off. So I said, you know, would it be okay with you if, um, you know, if, if we talk to the architect and, you know, have some suggestions? And she's like, great. Yeah, there's some things that I'm not happy about. And, you know, so we kind of went through his set and we had some suggestions and i think we kind of like redlined over parts of it for kind of like let's explain what we're seeing and what we're thinking how these spaces could be a little bit different and um you know so got on a zoom with him and the client and kind of talked it through and he was i would describe it as apoplectic i mean like <laughs> stammering spitting turning red oh, <laughs> was my. Wow. really angry <clears throat> and the client was like well, I like all these things. These these are all good suggestions. Like, I don't know why we didn't have them in the first place, but I like them. And he was more or less like, how dare you? Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's just your job to pick the tile. And it was like, you know, I mean, yeah. I've been doing this a long time. I've been in a lot of remodels. I have a sense of space and, and I'm very aligned with your client. Like, whereas I think maybe he was quite a bit older, maybe he doesn't have children, maybe didn't right. really understand her life and her lifestyle and what I was hearing. So, you know, it was, it was so, so bad. I think at least four or five times during the Zoom, he announced, I've been doing this for 40 years. Anyone who starts <laughs> proclaiming they've been doing things for decades, you can You've shut the fuck up. You've been doing things wrong yeah. for 40 years. Uh, uh, sorry it to doesn't swear, mean but anything. honestly, anytime there's an architect, whoever, a contractor is like, I've been doing it for so-and-so. I'm like, I don't care, man. 
I yeah, do not my care. My reaction was, I can tell. And, and it looks like you drew this set like in the 90s yeah. for a woman who was a stay-at-home mother. Like yeah. this is not, you know, you are exactly. not understanding our client here. And let's be respectful. Like we're both professionals in our industry. I could go off. I've been doing this for 20 years, you know, whatever. Yeah. But like, you know, our ultimately what we should both want is what our client wants yeah. and what is yeah. the right thing for our client. It's not about you and your ego, but this guy clearly had this monster ego and could not believe that I would ever dare to suggest these things. And, you know, was just so rude that literally at the end of the zoom, the client looked at me and she's like, I'm going to fire him. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. Yeah. And then I got to bring in an architect that I like. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. It worked out for the best for everyone. Thank you. And you know who you are. If you ever listen to this podcast, <laughs> going apoplectic, insisting how long you've been doing this and refusing to listen to anyone's suggestions because we turned out all the better for it. <laughs> well, you know, it's an interesting, there's a lot of stuff to unpack with all of this. Um, but one one thing specifically is it tends to be the people who have to, to start claiming that they've done things for so long. Usually it means that they have been, yes, but they've been doing the same thing over and exactly. over for that time. Yeah. Like 90% of the time, that's the case when people start saying stuff like that. Exactly. Exactly. And his architecture, I mean, not just to, you know, talk about the interiors, but I would say the same of the exterior. I mean, I took one sure. look at the exterior elevation was like, oh, this thing <laughs> is a hot mess. And you know, yeah, it looks like somebody who's, yeah, been drawing kind of variations on a theme for 20 years. And in fact, I swear half the CAD module literally looked like he must have taken blocks from other projects and just like yeah. <laughs> assembled wow. them together. It was yeah. just like, what is this? So, um, yeah, that is not a selling point for me. You know, if you've been doing this for 40 years, I expect you to still be doing cutting edge work and draw something impressive. And that's not what that was. So, yeah, for sure. <laughs> At the very least, be a bit more professional and yes <laughs> polite, professional perhaps respectful of someone who also yeah. works in your industry and has some ideas yeah and you're uh, right i mean yeah i mean you know for us we always tell that to clients we're always like we don't have an ego we don't really care where the best ideas come from as long exactly. as it makes it into the project so exactly. i think you know if we each start to like pointing fingers at each other and and have a relationship that's more of a fighting relationship rather than a collaborative one then the project is going to suffer i mean and it's going to reflect that when you think about it, even in the office, it doesn't make sense. It's not like all the ideas come from one person. It's not, it's not the case. I mean, unless you run your office that way, uh, not you, but whoever. But generally, no, it's a collaborative effort, even within exactly. the office. So why would it matter if someone else comes up with it? And they exactly. Now, that was yeah. my reaction was, you know, we're if we're going to work on this project together, we need to work as a team, right? And that's yeah. always my attitude is the, the best suggestion wins and the architects I like to work with, you know, if I have a suggestion, you know, that's architecturally related, they're open to hearing it. And if they have a suggestion about the interiors, I'm opening, you know, I'm open to hearing it because like you, I, I just want the best project that I can possibly be a part of. And yeah. so whose idea it is, I don't really care, you know, best idea wins. And yeah, that's, uh, you know, thank God I didn't have to work with that guy. And I think I actually <laughs> told the client too, like, well, thank God you're going to fire him because I, I can't work with someone like that. Sure. I'm just, I won't, I've been doing this too long. I have a lot of work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> it's not yeah, going to work yeah, a job yeah. with someone like that. It's It would be a miserable experience. I don't want to have to fight this guy's ego every step of the way. So, yeah, you know, I'm 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 like you. I like a collaborative, open-minded, respectful process. And and the smart clients get it, too, because uh, we, we actually have had clients who f fire uh, the other, the previous uh, architect slash contractor mm -hmm. or whoever it is. Uh, because if they're intelligent clients, they, they get it. They're like, why is that guy saying that stuff? It's, it's weird. Why is he behaving this way? Or he or she, yeah. why are they behaving this way? I don't, I don't want that. And I think soon they start to realize, okay, well now I have this other person who's talking sense. Yes. But also they seem like they're nice people and they're being cordial and helpful. I have this other person who's being a stick in the mud. Why would I keep you around? I exactly. Why would I keep you around? Um, I do also think that some of the rifts that take place between uh, designers and architects and inter-designers and architects is generally a generational thing. I do mm -hmm. think that there are, not I do think I know, that there are a lot of older architects who are very, frankly, just grumpy. And honestly, so, sometimes for good reason, because it's a tough profession and it, it takes a lot more than skill and talent to, to become successful in it, for sure. But they, they're just kind of, they're kind of like grumpy people. That's like the profile of architects generally anyway, as a stereotype. And they they just, they don't like the, the idea after X decades of years of battling that they now have this other person who's going to tell them to do something differently. And I think, mm -hmm. honestly, that's a lot of it. It's just... Well, and oftentimes architects, architects. <laughs> and oftentimes architects work with the stuff that's not so fun 
when maybe yeah. interior designers get to do more of like the pretty, you know, fun, fun things, fun things, things that yeah. you see. So I could see how, you know, maybe in 30 years we'd get grumpy too. Yeah. <laughs> 30 know. years right. of building codes. And angry and jealous. <laughs> you know, the, yeah, per yeah, yeah, the permitting yeah, process, yeah. you know, have made marks over them for years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Too many permitting true. red lines have, have taken Right, right. They've been trampled by like design review committees yeah. and, you know, permitting in San Francisco. And they're just like, oh, they're over it, right? They're done. But um, no, I get it. And I, I think you're right. I do feel like the ones where I've had the most difficulty have been architects that are um, significantly older than I am. And, you know, I, funny enough, I talked to another one recently about a project here in San Francisco that we were considering. As I said, I talked to the client and then before taking the job, I said, great, I'd love to talk to your architect. And, you know, I said, how are we going to work together? You know, what program are you working in? What software are you in? Mm -hmm. You know, we work in CAD, we work in Revit. What do you prefer? Happy to collaborate however you want. We can work in BIM 360 and share the model in the cloud, you know? Um, and he was like, oh, well, you won't be touching the set. You know, you're just picking things. He's like, you could make me a Pinterest board of the things that you like. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm not going to make you a Pinterest board. I'm going to select everything and document it in folio for you, yeah, you yeah. Know, and the contractor. <laughs> and so it was kind of interesting. It was clearly, he was just like, oh no, you're over there with your pretty pictures and you can send me your pretty pictures and then I'll draw it. And it was like, that's, that's not how I work. You know, now that said, I, I have worked with architects who do own the set. I mean, we did a large ground up with Carney Logan Burke in Wyoming, and they definitely wanted to own the, uh, you know, the full set, which was fine, you know, and then for us, we just kind of did everything in SKs or, you know, quick, quick mm -hmm. elevations to sort of express to them what we wanted and where we saw the materials going and terminations and all of that um, and provided it to them. And then they, you know, either rolled it into their set or they redrew it into their set. So, I mean, we can do that, right. But it's, you know, that implication that like, Right. somehow I'm not capable right. of drawing anything or understanding how things are made. And that I should just provide like a picture. I mean, I don't know mm -hmm. who he's worked with and I know, you know, no disrespect to my fellow colleagues. There are definitely designers here and everywhere else, right. Who cannot draw, who do not really understand how things get built and who do just kind of make, make pretty. And sometimes it turns out great. It's just not, you know, it's just not how I work. Yeah. Yeah. Th th that's also a really good point because I do think that one of this is not to excuse architects who are going to be rude to, to other professionals, but I do think one of the the difficulties with the design and inter design space is that there's just a huge variety of how in terms of how people practice. And the same thing goes for architecture, frankly, which like astonishes me sometimes the drawings yeah. I've seen. I'm like, who what is this? Like how are you even practicing right now? How are you getting hired? Like whoa but anyway, so um in, in interior design that you do have people as you described who operate more like here's a reference image and we're it's gonna look like that. So I'm just gonna tell my cabinet maker who I know, make something that looks like this and I'm gonna select stuff from rejuvenation hardware or whatever they're going to do and mm -hmm. that's how they go about doing it and i think it 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 maybe it produces also for his for other professionals like we well actually for us like when we are talking with an interior designer i have no idea on the spectrum where they are really unless we have a right. conversation and start to say okay like you said, let's break down how we're going to work. How do you work? Mm -hmm. So we can see how we're going to you know, mm -hmm. interface with each other. And um, it's it that interfacing sometimes is difficult when the the other person is, frankly, in my view, just very casual about documentation um, and everything mm -hmm. else. Uh, mm -hmm. It's I, I don't know how to. Well, I think it also comes from the fact that, you know, with, again, my biggest pet, pet peeve is HGTV, which just ruins oh, both of our yeah. profession, <laughs> yes. where basically, you know, like you could have a bunch of housewives who have nothing else to do but picking out cushions for their sofa, be, become and call themselves interior designers. And that's an issue for both of our profession where it just creates a, the wrong... <laughs> The wrong idea of how how we all work and operate. Well, the seriousness exactly. of it too. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I think you know, to me, it's it's maybe the di the difference between a decorator yeah. and a designer, right? And I think Ooh. there are some people in the industry who own the title decorator, right? Like they are very clear that like they do not do drawings, right? If they're brought in on a project, they're like, I need an architect. I don't draw millwork. I don't draw molding details. I don't do this. You know, I, I pick pretty surfaces and finishes. And if they're honest about that, that's great. You mm -hmm. know, I think there are a lot of people out there who call themselves interior designers who really are not, you know, yeah. they're really 
decorators. And, um, you know, and I do think it creates a lot of frustration. I see, you know, I have heard um, frustration from architects and particularly builders, you know, a lot of the builders I know. Yeah. The running joke is that, you know, the contractors all hate designers, you know, why yeah. do they hate designers? And when you talk to them about this, they're like, because we get these people who literally draw things that are like half-assed and yeah. <laughs> actually can't be built or like don't fit on the wall because they didn't measure it right or, yeah. you know, or they didn't draw anything at all. And literally you're right, like show up with a yeah. picture and are like, make it look like this, you know, or, or don't document things well or correctly. And that cause delays in construction or, you know, cause problems with sourcing and picking things that cannot be procured within the construction timeline. So I just think there's, there's a huge difference between people who, you know, have that skill set and understand how important these things are, because in the end, it all comes down to time and money. Like, do we mm. want a beautiful end product? Yes. Do you also need to document things appropriately, hand them over on time, source and select things that can get to the project within the timeline? Yes. And I do know that there's a lot of designers that can't, don't, you know, lack the level of discipline, organization, know-how, whatever it takes to, to do that. Yeah. And I, and I think that they I call it the high end tier or level, that level of documentation and the things you described, that's how you get to that end result. It doesn't happen by being, again, uh, casual or loose about it. I, you have to consider also for some of these projects, again, it's a year, one, two, three, you can't have a three year long process and be that loose about things. You're, you're, it's it's an odd thing because I feel like a lot of the 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 design and construction process and architecture process is really about spending the appropriate amount of time and money up front to save time and money later and to get a better quality. That's exactly. really the whole game. And a lot of folks maybe don't quite understand that or clients who are new timers, new new clients to, to a project think, well, we could probably get away with not actually spending that time and money up front for whatever this thing is and it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And we always tell them, look, every client thinks that they're the special one who's going to pull that golden ticket and be the one who makes it to the, right. to the chocolate factory without putting any of their work. I'm like, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. Don't try to game the system. It's not going to work. Don't try. Don't try. I mean, <laughs> yeah. and there's hundreds of prof thousands of professionals who would tell you the same thing. And if we're all saying this, all saying the same thing, it's for, it's probably for a good reason. It's for we've a good seen reason. It. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We had one recently where, you know, they were in the attempt to save money. He kind of said to me, well, you know, for the construction set, couldn't you just draw parts of it? Like, <laughs> you know, the parts we really care about, like the kitchen and the primary bathroom. And I was like, how is, how is the builder going to build the rest of it? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, there's a floor plan, but that certainly doesn't tell him in the other bathrooms, like, well, how, you know, how high should the sconce <laughs> be? Yeah. What does the face of the vanity that they're supposed to build look like if no one draws it? Like, this isn't, this isn't how this works, you know? Yeah. And in the end, it's just going to cost you more time and money yeah. because the contractor is going to come back to me or you and say, what is this vanity supposed to look like? Great. How tall is it supposed to be? Okay. Where's the sconce supposed to go? Where do you want your toilet paper holder? You know, I mean, all of these things, like you don't elevate yeah. it. There's nothing for them to go on. So either they're going to make it up and you're going to get what you're going to get, which you may not like, yep. or they're going to chase us all around with a bunch of questions and you're going to end up spending twice as much time as you would have to have us draw it and document it correctly up front. No, totally. And and again, at a certain tier, those these kinds of contractors, they don't want to go through that process. And they'll turn down projects. They'll be like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to be your contractor if you don't have a full CD set. Right. I'm not going to be your contractor if you're going to um, you know, limit the the involvement of the architect through construction and not have them do CA, all of these things. Mm -hmm. and so it tends to be the right people gravitate toward the right people in terms of the professionals, at least, I think. Um yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, cutting out CA is always a big mistake. And it is something yeah. I see clients, you know, they're hitting the pain point, right? So I get where mm -hmm. the thought process comes in, where they're sort of watching money bleed out. And I, I always try to explain this to clients too, that, you know, there's a wave in which like our fees go and there's a wave in which the construction fees go. And I get it that people tend to hit this point. And I don't know if you've seen this, but prior to closing, always seems to be the valley of death, right? In a construction <laughs> the where valley like, of death. <laughs> you know, there's like, it feels like you've been in it forever. Yeah. There's been wires and pipes hanging out of the walls forever. Like, why is this dragging on so long? And the money's bleeding out. And, you know, they start to get just like, ah, oh, fatigue and mm. it doesn't look like anything and they get bombed. And, you know, and I, I, that's kind of often where I see the pivot point where clients really start to like 
get super bummed out, you know, yeah. like, and start to try to cut things out, you know, like, oh, let's start axing this or let's, we don't need CA or we don't need OADC meetings every two weeks. Let's just meet once a month. You know, they start trying to do these kind of scattershot things that in my opinion are very unwise. You know, it's like keeping your OADC meetings, keeping the architect engaged, keeping the designer engaged throughout the process ensures the best product in the end and cutting those people out does not save money. Um, it does yeah. not. And, um, you know, and it's funny, and I always tell clients when this happens, because it does a lot, kind of hang in there when the drywall goes on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll turn the corner, you'll walk in and be like, oh, it looks like a room, you know, and it's like, it no, looks like a room, I have a room. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like they can conceptualize it, you know, and then pretty soon the finishes start going on. And then yeah. it's like, pretty, pretty, happy, happy. And, you know, we kind of turn the corner. But yeah, um, <laughs> yeah I agree with you that it's, you know, tr trying to cut minimal costs out of it by sidelining people. Um, and CA is never a good idea. And we tell we tell clients that pretty often, you mm -hmm. know, like uh, our professional fee is probably the the, the smallest fee exactly. out of the whole project. So really, if you're trying to save money and, and cutting corners, like our corner is really not one that should be cut because no. it's not going to give you a, yeah. a whole lot. Not a good idea. You know, and I'll say to clients too, well, you know, if the architect's out and or we're out, well, who's going to answer the questions, right? Yeah, so when exactly. there's an RFI from the builder... Yeah. Are, are you going to answer that? Yeah. Like, are, you know, are you going to go over the shop drawings for your millwork <laughs> and approve them by yourself without help? You know, no, like, that's a terrible I mean, idea. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it, there are exceptional people who can manage things in different right. professions and be pretty good at it. But um, of course, as with most things, uh, people who are not in the professions underestimate a lot of things, but just the time it takes t to review the shop drawings as, as a oh, yeah. specific example. Um yeah, it's it's really hard because the construction is stressful. A ton of money is being spent, and there's not really. It's an odd thing because I think with creating a house or creating a building, there's just not a lot you can do once you're going to 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 just take. You can't take shortcuts uh, for the quality's right. sake, but also it's not really going to help in the end. And frankly, also for most people, at least from we've seen when they have the money to do something really nice when it comes down to the question of okay either you sacrifice this nice thing or you don't and if you don't you know uh it no what was i saying if you don't it's going to cost you more money 99 percent of the time they're like no i still want it um right. you know that's what it comes down to and uh but it, yeah it is a long and complicated process I think. Mm -hmm. yeah it is and the you know the the time and money thing is always interesting and i you know i don't know your process on that but we've started recently to try to do kind of more rom budgeting like yes. rough order of magnitude for those not in the industry um <laughs> earlier on you know because it's so painful to go through those projects and i'm sure you've had them as we have where you get all the way through a permit set you know everything's specified you roll up a cd set then you get the pricing and the clients are like this is a million dollars more than i wanted to spend you know and then you're going through a massive VE exercise, which is also costly. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've really tried in the last few years on the projects that we're on to advocate for um, early, early, like bef way before the permit, you know, um, kind of go in with a schematic set. And we have a set of placeholder specifications that we've created over time that I would say cover 80% of our projects in terms of realm of reality of like mm -hmm. how much per faucet, how much per square foot of tile, how much for flooring, how much for carpet, what do we assume for wall finishes, right? Trim detail, like just some assumptions that get us into the realm of reality so that when we hand it to a builder, the ROM we get back is, is better, you know, cause yes. I feel like without that, um, you know how it goes. If you don't have elevations and you don't have any specs, it's, you the know, builder it's can't, like, yeah. They don't yeah, know what throwing to do. a spitball at the wall. Yeah. They don't know what to do, or they low, or they want the job, right? So they just throw an artificially low number at it, and then we're all caught out later on, like, oh, sweet, he gave me three dollars a square foot for tile. What am I going to do now? You know, yeah. so um, you know, trying to make sure that we're like in the realm of reality for the caliber of the project <laughs> and for what the client desires. Um, and I found it to be really useful because we have recently had a couple where it's like that comes back and it's higher than the clients want. It's like, okay, well, thank God we figured this out now before we had an entire permit set. Let's go back and figure this out, right? Either we're going to take square footage off or we're going to dumb it down or there's going to be something, but it's certainly better to do it early than late. No, we're in total agreement. And that's, that's precisely what we do. Um, and it's interesting. So the, the way it works for us is that 
in the, very, in the first conversations, there's a, there's a discussion about cost per square foot, which is a really horrible way to talk about things. But and when there's nothing drawn, there's not a whole lot more you can do. Right. Uh, use reference images and say, OK, this is like what you're going for. I can tell you it's going to be at least this much. Mm-hmm. And then at pretty much every phase of the project, either in the middle of the phases or the end, we do an ROM of some kind. And okay. it gets more okay. and it starts out very fuzzy. It gets more and more specific. Mm-hmm. And at mm-hmm. some point... And honestly, it varies from project to project. But as soon as we can, we put together a pricing set that in many cases will have placeholder uh, specs of some kind, uh, materials and everything you said. And we give it to, hopefully, there's a contractor who's performing proper pre-construction and say, okay, take Mm -hmm. a look at this. Mm -hmm. The the Because it just makes sense. And it kind of astonishes me that it, it wasn't until maybe the last 10, 15 years that this has started to become... I don't think it's the norm, but becoming more, at least I want to make it the norm, uh, becoming more the norm was before it was, let's just get all the way through. <laughs> like, right. Get all the way through and then we price it. And yeah. then mm-hmm. surprise, right. When you, you know, are ready to start construction, then you'll find out what it's going to cost to build this. And I, yeah. So I, and I'm glad to hear that you do it. I am amazed by how many architecture firms do not. No, I hate, um, I hate, <laughs> I, I don't want it either way. Cause it makes me nervous. Um, well, and it's, it's a waste of money too for the client's money. Like, exactly. why would we spend time, you know, developing all the details for something we don't even know how much it's going to cost? It doesn't right, make any right. sense. At all. Why design something you can't afford to build? Yeah. You know, ultimately. Um, and I, you know, the other thing I'm happy to hear is that you do have that cost per square foot discussion with clients up front. I find lots and lots of architects do not, um, and we often will get onto a project where it's like get permit set phase, and you know, sometimes I'll say to the client like, oh, well, I'm I'm sure you and the architect talked about cost per square foot. You know, what were those conversations like? Oh, no, we haven't talked about that. And it's like, oh, okay. (laughs) You know, and I do remember one time asking an architect that I knew pretty well. I was like, I don't understand. Like, you know, I think it was actually because I literally sat in a meeting with this architect and heard them tell our client that they were going to build this house for like, I don't know what they said, you know, 700 a square foot. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, no, this is like a (laughs) $1,200 a square foot house, you know? And I think I said to him later, like, I don't understand. Like, do you not know what the construction costs are? Like, it's possible you don't, right? Maybe you're like not that involved in CA and you don't really know at the end what the full cost was, or are you kind of being misleading? And he more or less was like, if I really told people what it was going to cost, they probably would never do it. And it was like, Ooh, that's not, that's not my approach, right? My approach is like, let's lay this on the table. Let's be honest about what the current construction costs are for the architectural style, the lot, you know, like, yeah. is this a steep lot? Are we going to spend a quarter million dollars digging and then another quarter million dollars on concrete? You know, yeah. like, let's talk about that. Right. And, and, you know, I just don't want to get into something where people are going to be angry, disappointed. And you're right, Marina, you know, waste money, right. Yeah. On, on designing something that simply is not within the budget. And, and our approach is always with our clients, you know, as much as we love drawing things in the computer, our goal is to see it built. So yeah, if yeah. we agreed on a exactly. project, but we know it's going to cost them double, but we're not telling them that, then the project's probably never going to happen. And it's not, it's we're not, not interested <laughs> to like do, you know, like yeah. fantasy land type of architecture that that's not, that's not what we're into. But it's 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 interesting to to hear from you that you've noticed that architects don't mention the price per square foot, which to us doesn't make any sense. And even if we don't know it directly, we talk to contractors mm-hmm. everywhere we work to get a sense of in this specific location what is the price per square foot for mm-hmm. something of this quality. And, exactly. And we know we notice more and more that clients have no idea of what things cost. You know, we had a potential client who was showing us reference images of houses that are probably like 15 to 20 million built and he wanted to do his house for 300 square foot and we're like (laughs) you know same thing like we can i always tell them we can turn dirt into gold like as much (laughs) as we can be creative like there's just you know so much we can do so setting the expectations on all front i think is it's it's crucial it's a weird thing with all this with building with the construction industry too because with the level that you're going to be at in terms of construction quality or design quality, whatever that tier is, the cost is, it's kind of going to be what it's going to be. Like we can't, no one can, even the contractor says this too. It's like the contractors are like, I can't change the price of wood. I can try to find cheaper right. wood, but that doesn't really exist. I can't change the price of labor and my profit a lot of times is a percentage of those things. So I don't really know what you want me to do. Um, 
and I don't know. It's I wish things weren't so expensive. To be honest, uh, it's, it's yeah. it is crazy expensive yeah. now. It is crazy expensive. I mean, particularly you know the markets that we're working in, right? I mean, you're <clears throat> Los Angeles and San Francisco, and we're San Francisco and Lake Tahoe, and you know it's funny because. In Tahoe, we have the problem of a lot of Bay Area clients have this perception of like, oh, it's Tahoe. It's like a hinterland. <laughs> it's going to be super cheap to build up there. And I'm like, it's actually more expensive yeah. to build in Tahoe now than it is to build in the Bay Area. And people are shocked by that, but it is true. And it is the labor market. It's not materials, right? Like you're, to your point, lumber in the Bay Area and lumber in Tahoe are basically the same thing. You know, it's not that. It's not the materials. It's the labor costs. And it's a very tight yeah labor market up there. It's a small yeah. area. The yeah. housing is very expensive. There's simply not enough labor. Um, and it is shocking how, how high it is. Um, you know, so it is, there's some regional variations, but across the board, it is, it is high, you know, and I would rather clients know that going in and, you know, that we kind of start with, well, what is the ultimate budget and let's design to that, you know, not go backwards and design something that we can't afford to build. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, there, there was something you mentioned earlier uh, that I want to pick up on <laughs> regarding floor plans specifically. Well, these two hours like blew by super fast. That's crazy. We're at twelve forty-five. That's good. Um, <clears throat> uh, I lost my train of thought now. Uh -oh. oh, I, oh, I just, <laughs> I just wanted to comment and say that that I, I, I think one of the the differences between architects and interior designers or designers, generally, generally, is that I think that. Designers are much more open to being very intimate with a client and understanding their living patterns at a much mm -hmm. finer grain uh, level of detail. And therefore, when they create a floor plan, if they have that ability of interior architecture expertise, that floor plan is a much better fit for them. Be and I say that because I have seen, same as you, floor plans done by architects for clients and then somehow we get brought on board and the floor plan first of all employs a lot of very erroneous just common sense things like doors that don't open the right way or doors that open but then hit the bed like atrocious things and then also stuff that doesn't make sense for the client and the way we work even if we're just doing the the architecture portion of, of a house is to understand the client like really 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 deeply mm -hmm. um especially for the floor plan and the program adjacencies and the things you were talking about earlier and i honestly i do not understand why architects who specialize in residential don't do that and they end up producing these floor plans like you described um that, that we've both seen and right. I think the and it, the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 a weird thing. Uh, but I do think also that's maybe where designers are are just much more willing to engage with the client at that level when architects mm -hmm. are a little bit more like hands off ish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, I mean, obviously, you have the concern that we don't right? of like, well, how does this reflect to the outside of the building? You know? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah, there's always that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, like, I would really like a window over my bathroom saying, <laughs> great, what does that look like from the outside? You know, yeah. I don't have to worry about that. That's your job. Um, but you know, <laughs> yeah, the inside, you're right. I mean, we are, we are in really deep with the clients, um, you know, in terms of how they live and a lot of it is the questionnaire helps and then there are lots of conversations as we're designing these spaces like you know bathrooms you know i mean we have one client in tahoe that cracked me up because she was like oh my god my husband has like more hair supplies than any person on the planet he needs like his own cabinet because he has so much hair stuff the man does have great hair you know <laughs> but <laughs> okay you know so we like literally designed on his side of the bathroom like his own cabinet for his hair products um awesome. you know just just things like that right sort of even in a couple like well do you both go to bed at the same time yep. do you get up at the same time you know for me laying out like a primary suite that's a huge conversation doing it right really involves kind of what are your lives like together right is one person a night owl and one goes to bed early mm -hmm. and one's up early well then you probably want the one who's up early to be able to go in and use the bathroom and get dressed without waking the other person so let's think about division you know so that we're not having sound transfer mm -hmm. um you know just all of those conversations and it's a lot of you know frankly very intimate details about kind of how people live their lives and um you know and what they value too you know i feel like there's in floor plan sure it's kind of how do you live how do you entertain who comes over who's part of your household um you know how do you cook who cooks who cleans up are you cooking together alone you know just all these conversations and then you know that level of detail also dovetails into the furnishings work too because nobody has an unlimited budget and so then there's always conversations around value and what you value you know do you want 
the most stunning chandelier anyone's ever seen in the entry hall and that's what you really care about and then we're going to save money elsewhere or is it that you want you know the most amazing flex form sofa you know because you really want something <laughs> comfortable and you're willing to spend fifty thousand dollars for the most amazing sofa with the great fabric and you know but other things like the rugs well i don't care about that i have dogs the dog's gonna puke on it you know so it's like kind of getting that you know there's a lot of those yeah, conversations yeah, yeah. around sort of like yeah relative value that that inform everything yeah no totally one of the things that we always try and do it's not always possible but is to tour the person's existing current current residence mm -hmm. with them now, for sure if it's a remodel obviously you're going to go to the house yeah, but right. even if it's going to be a new home it's okay. actually very very helpful to see how they live and there's this interesting and it's a it's a way to get insights to all the things you mentioned because i do find that finding out that information it's really hard to do in, let's say, uh, one session over mm -hmm. lunch. Like it, it, mm -hmm. it, it takes, and a lot of these things are learned throughout the project, also, anyway. Right. Right. But um, being in someone's house just allows you a different point of access to these things. And it ends up being an interesting balance, I think, for, for all of us to try and create this, this new house, let's say, that is, you know, is going to fit with them and how they're used to living, but also be a departure from that. Because mm -hmm. whenever someone's doing a remodel, a new house, it's, yeah, it's for like utility reasons, but it's also for potentially a lifestyle change. It's an advancement mm -hmm. of some kind. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's a big deal to build a house. It should be this new thing. And I think finding that, that balance is also, it's one of the, the kind of edges that we have to like constantly balance on to see when we are a pushing the advancement in in the right way versus too much. Right. Uh, right. Versus, you don't want them to be uncomfortable yeah. in their home. Right. And that's something I always um, definitely consider on a project is kind of where is the line, right. Of sort of taking what's, what's the client's comfort level, who are they and expressing that in the best possible version. And then hopefully hmm. pushing the envelope a little bit, you know, maybe out of their comfort level, but not so much that, you know, I would never want to do a project where someone comes home and feels like this isn't me. I don't sure. feel comfortable here. I feel like I'm in a hotel or it feels too fancy or yeah, yeah. It feels too precious. Right. Like, you know, those, those are things I, I don't want. And I think, you know, for a lot of our clients, um, you know, it's, it's easy for me to have these conversations maybe because not all of them, but a lot of them, I have overlap in one way or another, right? Like I have three kids, I have five pets, you know? Like, <laughs> oh my. So a lot of the time, like the people I'm working with, you know, they have kids and it's all yeah. about durability. Yep. I get that. I've been there, you know, or we have two big dogs and, you know, they want to climb on the couch and we need to have durable fabrics. And it's like, got, got that. I got five pets. Like, yeah. you know, like, yeah. you know, so I kind of get it. Like I've, I've lived a lot of these things uh, one way or another. So I have some personal experience that I think also, you know, helps inform that. Like my, my cats, I say road test everything for me. If they can't destroy it, it cannot be destroyed. So I definitely know like what can survive. My cats are like Uber destroyers. And so they're terrible little beasties, but um, yeah, I now know like the very few things that they will not take apart. That's funny. So they're part of the team too. Yeah. 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 Exactly. They're, they're yeah R&D my... division. <laughs> Material testing. My, unpla my unpaid employees. I mean, I've gone as far as like when we're considering carpet for clients, taking it home, like a sample. Yeah. And yeah putting it down <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, yeah. and being like, how about it, Lucy? Let's see what you can do to this, you know? And just <laughs> well, it passed the Lucy test. You should be good exactly. for at least exactly. 10 years. Yeah. Lucy can't destroy it. We're good. It's funny. <laughs> um, my last question, because it is already the end, um, is who is your favorite designer or do you have a favorite building or interior, something that just kind of like makes you feel something special? Ooh, good question. We usually ask that to architects, which, uh, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's easier because it's like a whole building, but... I don't I know. know. It's a hard question. It's a hard question. I mean, you know, I'll say that I was in Paris in January for Maison at Objet and Deco Off, and so what popped into my head is the Musée d'Orsay, oh, mm. yeah, yeah. Um, which I just think is like... Mm. It's just breathtaking, you know, and I, I love that, like, the clock is still there and that it's this repurposed, right, building. Um but you know just just beautiful breathtaking beautiful use of light space mm. it's so hard to pick one <laughs> no, that, it's, it's, a, a, good it's one, a good though. one and That's it's an interesting one. building because it has the juxtaposition of the old and the new part in the way that the the interior exhibition is laid out it's a much more contemporary way but the mm -hmm. way the facade and the structure is is uh, you know an older building so yeah, historic yeah, yeah exactly and then i did just tour um frank lloyd wright's Taliesin West. Oh, oh, did yeah. you really? So did we. 
Oh, you did? Yeah, oh my yeah, gosh, just yeah. the last month last or month? so ago, yeah. Oh, gosh, we were there almost the same time. I think I was there like two weeks ago. Awesome. Um, oh, wow. And I had not seen it before, and I am a Frank Lloyd Wright um, fan. Um, and to me, you know, one of my favorite things is always touring a home or a studio or some space that is an architect's own. Interesting. Um, you know, because there's the work you do for others, and then there's the work you do for yourself. Mm. And um, because that was his home in the winter time, you know, for many years, what, 20 years, um, you know, seeing what he built when it was for himself, for his personal use, um, you know, for the use of the students and the staff, I, uh, you know, I, I found that really fascinating and really just uh, had such a great sense of place and light. And yeah, what did you think of it? I'm curious to hear. Oh, I was going to ask you, what did you think of the lounge? I yeah. thought it was amazing. Um, yeah. I mean, the story behind it is also just I incredible, but there's, I think also we were reflecting on it, um, I think on the show, actually, of uh, Vitalius and West, that it was very much a design build project. Mm -hmm. And I, th and I think things back in the day with Wright were much more that way anyway. And I was speculating and wondering, I don't know if something quite as intricate could be done without a design build approach mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and also the fact that he was frank lord right um, well he was experimenting right. a lot of things yeah experimenting so, yeah yeah in a way mm -hmm. it was kind of imperfect and not always you know like incredible in the detail of the execution but he was onto something mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah the fact that it started out as a camp you know i found yeah. that fascinating yeah. that it was meant to be <laughs> sort of temporary right and that there there wasn't glass in it originally and yep. it was it was really that camp mentality and then you're right it evolved over time you know and i suppose they also had the luxury of spending that much time in that place you know to get yeah. a really deep understanding of you know the light the space weather you know cloud movements i mean all of those things that that's that's kind of a luxury that it's rare to have right when you're designing something but uh yeah it was fantastic to see no that's a very good point the lounge i think it was the lounge or the living room the, the living space room. that had the fireplace and the piano mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. that was yeah. a great space. Yeah. That space that was a great space i liked his studio too his studio office that had oh, kind yeah, of yeah. a huge rock fireplace <laughs> and they had kind of you know i don't know if that rock was there or they put the rock in yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know working around those those details i of course was looking at it thinking like i bet this leaks but <laughs> <laughs> it 100 does yeah, 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 yeah. yeah to your point yeah. like it doesn't look super well though <laughs> no. but <laughs> no, no, and they're and they're going undergoing uh, a lot of kind of tests and questions to try and figure out how to solve some of these issues so they can keep it around and right. not have it just fall it apart. Over time. We mm -hmm. visited yeah. Falling Water a few years ago, and I think someone mentioned like, yeah, all the leaks that was going through the windows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, you know. Well, it was done like a well, hundred years ago. Yeah, so. the, yeah. <laughs> it was. Uh, you know, old places leak. I should know. I've owned a bunch of them. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Um, Holly, this was fantastic. I think this was, it, it, it went by the quickest of probably all the recordings we've ever done, uh, which is a good sign. Thanks so much for making the time Aww. and let's continue well, the chat. Thank you, David Marina. This was so much fun. I really, uh, love talking with you. Thank you everyone for listening to this episode and thank you for our guest, Holly, for joining the show. If you like this show, please share it around. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. I think you can also subscribe and rate the show on Spotify, YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. All of our episodes are on the website, secondstudiopod.com. And of course, you can find us on Instagram more often than not if you want to see what we're up to. We have a lot more coming up before the end of 2023. So stay tuned. We do. Uh, we also have a hotline. That's a good way you can reach out to. Did you mention the hotline? No. Nope. nope. Okay. Hotline, which is 213 222 6950. You can call and leave a voicemail or text any messages, questions, and things like that. And uh, you can find our office, which is out there in the world on all of the typical places. All right. Talk soon. Bye. Bye bye.